What's the need for training? We train because we care about others. We agree to stand, fight, and die for those that we love. Become an asset to your community, not a liability. Visit VindictiveSolutions.com. Come get some training. You can also visit ReadyMadeResources.com where the next two training courses are going to be at March 14th through the 17th. This is our big four-day course. That is $1,000. We do feed people lunch and dinner on that course. Um, so if you don't have any of the basics, visit us in February for the basics and come right back in March for some of the advanced stuff. Hope to see you there. Have you been looking for a trusted long-term storable food company? We have a solution for you. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our line of resealable fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Our food is completely GMO-free, and our stringent quality controls, plus testing for heavy metals, makes us unique in the storable foods market. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. When you purchase from simplycleanfoods.net, not only will you be receiving high-quality food, but you will also be supporting veterans in need across the country and those who are affected by natural disasters. Right now, Amazon Prime members will receive fast two-day shipping. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's simplycleanfoods.net. But do it today. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has said, you will own nothing and you will love it. And that's represented by what's going on across the planet today, where the economy of the world is in free fall. And nowhere is it more in evidence than with our own President Biden deliberately trying to sabotage what we have, access to food, other resources. So Americans are in a unique position, really for the first time in our history, we're going to have to provide for ourselves or subject ourselves to the whim of the government. Do you really trust a government to feed you that left a thousand Americans behind enemy lines in Afghanistan? I don't think so. So where do you go? When you ask the question, who's the best prepper out there today? There's only one answer. Ready-made resources and Robert Griswold. I call him King Prepper. And that's how a lot of people think of him. You have everything there you'd want from night vision to storable food how to prepare cooking in emergency situations books and videos on how to prepare alternative energy communication first aid that you wouldn't think of natural antibiotics you name it bob has it now here's the good thing about bob griswold that no one else does but him you don't have to buy anything to talk to him if you're not sure where to start with your preparation, no obligation phone call directly to Bob. You can talk to him for free. Most people will charge you an arm and a leg for a half hour conversation. That's not Bob Griswold. He cares about helping America get prepared. Go to readymaderesources.com or you can call the number directly at 800-627-3809. Again, that contact information readymaderesources.com for the best prepping outfit in the country or call Bob Griswold directly 
Hey everybody, Dave Podges here, host of the Common Sense Show, and we have a show called the Doug and Dave Intel Report, and my partner is with me, uh, Doug Thornton, former DHS, former combat marine and defense contractor, wore a lot of hats in his life, and we have famed explorer Mondo Gonzalez, who's done just tremendous work. Oh, we've covered so much of his archaeological digs, but we're not going to go there right now. We're going to be talking about something called the Red Heifer. And I, I'm going to be like you in the audience. A lot about. But I can't wait to hear what Mondo and Doug have to say about it. But before we go there, though, uh, you need food, water, guns, gold, ammo, natural medicine and tools, basic survival essentials. And I'm telling you right now, so you can afford to get the stuff that you need. You better get your money the heck out of the bank because more banks are on the watch list. The Dodd-Frank Law 2010 says they can take your money. And don't think for a second they won't soften their fall with your funds and you'll be out. And my mom's family, by the way, we were related to the Fords. We were cousins in my mom's side of the family. And they were wealthy and they lost everything in one night. And my mom went from riches to rags as a three-year-old. So uh, you, don't, you don't need to tell me it can happen. I grew up hearing about this stuff. So you really need to get your money out of the bank, have operating capital. Noble Gold, my favorite, favorite precious metal company. I've been a customer for six years, been an advertiser for six and a half. They will take care of you. No pressure. And every time I need to make an adjustment in my finances, I go back to Noble Gold. They'll get your 401k, your IRA out so the bank can't steal it. And they'll put it under your control and you'll own it. And then they will convert your soon to be worthless fiat cash into precious metals that have held its value for 6,000 years. Go to DaveHodgesGold.com and I'll send you a free information packet. That's DaveHodgesGold.com. And obviously they're going to know you're coming for me. And you can tell them I said best company to deal with. They're my favorite, favorite company that I deal with. Anyway, gentlemen, welcome back to part two. I absolutely cannot wait to get started on this. And uh, Doug, my timer just failed, so I'm going to depend on you to keep me on task. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, in part one, we talked about Apophis and the spinoff effects and the deception from NASA and, and what we can expect. And we, we talked about very definitive biblical overtones in this. And and uh, I really, if you haven't heard part one, I would encourage you to go back and listen. And I think really the warnings that we left at the end are very telling. But we're going to start with the red heifer. So Mondo, let me just throw it to you. Why don't you introduce the topic to my audience, our audience? I sh- yeah, I mean, the I think sometimes the the average Christian might go, what in the world? Why should I even care about a red cow? I mean, we say red heifer. Um, it just it's another word for for a female cow. And now I will say this, that, you know, uh, many people who are in the cattle industry, uh, they have very specific terminology for the different types of cows. So mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just giving the basic English. Uh, there is there is some very specific Hebrew words about the red cow uh, that doesn't apply to, to modern English cattle industry standards. So just be gracious with that. But <clears throat> So th- this is why I mean I wrote a book recently on it on on the on the red heifer the red cow the 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 last piece of the third temple puzzle the reason why this is important is because first of all you know the red heifer ceremony appears in the Bible it appears in the Old Testament yes uh, it's in the book of Numbers chapter nineteen uh, this was an instruction that God gave to Moses uh, concerning the original tabernacle. And then the ultimately Solomon's temple. And then, of course, the second temple of Jesus's day. And uh, the basic ceremony, uh, just for background, is that, you know, we're as Christians, we don't live, you know, in in terms of being clean and unclean or ritually pure or impure. That's not how we live because we're not taking our offering or a sacrifice every week to a a holy place like a temple. Um, uh, because we're, we're saved through the blood of Jesus. And so we don't think in those terms. We think, am I forgiven or I'm not forgiven? But the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, they thought in terms of forgiveness and for, and unforgiveness, but as well as being pure and, and impure or clean and unclean. So in, in that regard for them, God had established, if you were to come into the temple, you know, th- at least three times a year to offer your sacrifice, uh, your Passover, Pentecost, and and, and tabernacles, you would have to approach the the temple complex 
in a ritually pure state. And so one of the ways in which he provided to become ritually pure um, is, I'll give you an example. If you were with your dad the night before because he was sick and he died, boom, you're unclean. Now, now you're, 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 you're eliminated from going to the temple, which you maybe planned the next day because your dad died. Well, God knows that's a normal part of life. So he instituted the ref he red heifer, which was a pure animal. Uh, it was red uh, in its third year, no blemishes, uh, never had a yoke upon it, etc. And what Moses was called to do was to go out and to burn this animal outside of the camp. It was not offered on the normal uh, tabernacle or temple altar. It was outside. Uh, in the first century, it was offered on the Mount of Olives. We know that from writings from around 200 AD. And so what they would do, they would burn, the, they would slaughter the cow. They would sprinkle the blood that way. They would burn the cow with all the ashes. They would take the ashes and they would mix it with water. And then that, that solution, you could go to the priest and the priest would sprinkle you and you would become ritually clean. So that's the biblical background for what they did. And, and so as we set the stage, um, you think, okay, well, that's great. I guess I just got a little Bible lesson on, on the Old Testament. Why does that matter now? Well, the reason why it matters now is because in the Bible, in, in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel's describing that at the time of the end, there would be sacrifices taking place. Well, sacrifices take place in a temple. Uh, so Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, he describes a future abomination or desecration of the temple that happens again in the holy place, which is a temple. Uh, Paul speaks in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that this coming world ruler, this Antichrist figure, is going to come in and declare himself to be God in the temple, in the physical temple. And then we also see in Revelation chapter 11 that John, uh, when he sees a vision of the end times, he got he's told to measure the temple area, leave out the outer precincts. And so we have from those four passages, Daniel, Jesus, John, and Paul, that they all predicted that in the end, in the time of the end, there would be this temple in existence. Well, we look around. Well, there's no temple. Well, agreed. So this tells us that it's coming. It is predicted. I believe it's scripture is going to be true. Jesus's words are true. Uh, all the rest of scripture is true. So even though we don't see a temple now, we know that it's coming. And really beginning in the 1980s, people can go online. They can see all this for themselves. If they just do a search for Temple Institute or Temple Mount Faithful, that's an early organization, or even thirdtemple.com, uh, you'll see that these organizations have been working for 50 years to make everything ready for this, this coming third temple. Well, these are Jewish rabbis. These are not believers in Jesus. Uh, they're, they're looking to reestablish uh, the Mosaic law, the Mosaic tem temple system that, uh, again, was originated under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. So that really is kind of the background of why it's important now, because um, as of right now, I mean, let's just take the red heifer out for a moment. They have everything they need to set the temple up tomorrow. Everything is in place beginning in the 1980s. They have mm -hmm. the golden menorah. They have the temple garments. They have the temple crown. They got all the implements. They got the altar of incense. They got the table of showbread. All the things that we read about in basically Exodus 25 through 30, they've re remade. They've remade all these. But interestingly, there's one thing that's missing, and that is they do not have uh, any ashes from the previous red heifers. There's been nine in history from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus that have been slaughtered and offered, and um, they do not have those. So they cannot build, even if they got permission tomorrow, they could not do anything because. They have not been able to cleanse and to purify the area because they need the red heifer. So here comes the red heifer. So that is a that's a backdrop to why the red heifer is important today to the Jewish rabbinical way of thinking. 
that's really interesting. And I want to throw kind of a curveball in here. What little bit I learned about the red heifer tied into the third temple as well. And um, Trump showed interest in the third temple. Can, uh, can you address that? Yeah, well, we see a couple things that he did. Uh, one of them was um, he was a, um, I would give him a grade of like a 98, you know, as his, as his relationship with Israel. Um, very, very positive. Uh, he was the only one with, with enough guts of all the presidents going back to Bill Clinton. Because uh, back in the 90s, Congress passed a resolution that the, um, the, uh, the, what, the embassy would be moved from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. But what they did is, I mean, they approved it. Done. Move it. But they allowed the president, based on geopolitical considerations, to uh, delay it every six months. And so, you know, uh, uh, Clinton, then Bush, Obama, they all kept pushing, kicking the can down the road. Well, in 2017, Trump was had enough guts to say, you know what, we're going to do it. These the, the Palestinians, etc. The world, the, they, the Middle East, they just need to accept it. It's our embassy. We believe the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. We're going to do it. And so, by doing that, what he did is he established. I'm sorry, he established the legitimacy of Israel's right to have Jerusalem as its eternal capital, which again, that leads to the second um, idea of um, giving tacit approval that they would have all of Jerusalem, including the 35 acres of the Temple Mount as Israel's sovereign uh, you know, possession. Uh, it's really interesting, and, and I want to throw one more curveball in there because you really cleared that up for me. But I'm a Christian, and I stand with the people of Israel, um, and, and I'm doing my best. But I'm having a hard time standing with the Israeli government because of their six-hour delay in, in trying to save the people that were attacked on October 7th. That's uh, To me, that's undisputed. And also, too, the genocide that's going on in Gaza. Um which I think is going way overboard in terms of they're not handling it the right way. You don't kill children to get retribution. Um, help us reconcile that with the Bible, the Israeli government versus the Israeli people. You know, that's a great question. And um, in the book that I wrote, uh, again, it, it's a great question. As Christians, as New Testament Christians, what do we do here? You know, how, how do we the Bible tells us those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. So how do we navigate these waters, understanding the, the, the value of blessing Israel? And so what I did in there is I spent a couple chapters discussing the theology of what it means to be national Israel. And I said, okay, so what does that really mean? Well, <clears throat> I answered it this way because a lady had written in to our ministry and she said, hey, it's kind of the same thing that you brought up, Dave. She said, hey, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling friends and family that, you know, we should support Israel. And they're going, hey, wait a minute. Why would I support Israel? And they list off all these things mm -hmm. similar to what you just did. And they said, you know, the only place in the Middle East where you can fly a, a pride flag is in Tel Aviv. So, I mean, so you have these other moral issues as well. And I said, OK, I said, great question. Well, first of all, what, what we need to do in these situations is to simply acknowledge it. I mean, Israel as a government, is not perfect by any means at all. And in fact, um, we know that Israel, if people look at the modern history of Israel, they were founded by mostly atheists and socialists, mm -hmm. and even many of them flirted with communism. I mean, these guys, <clears throat> from the beginning, uh, David Ben-Gurion and others, the first president and prime minister of Israel, these guys were all socialists. I mean, this is why you had, even back then, this, this kind of tension between that group, the atheist agnostic group, and the religious group. The religious group actually didn't even want the nation, uh, the state of Israel to be established because it was established by a bunch of socialist atheists. So from their religious perspective, they said, <clears throat> no, if, if the nation is going to be reestablished, it'll be reestablished miraculously by God himself or the Messiah. So, so at the end of the day, what I take people to is I said, look, if we go to Deuteronomy 9, our approach should be the exact same approach that God has. And God says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, I have this in the book, that Israel, I'm bringing you into the land, right? They're, they're just getting ready to come in to take possession. And he says, don't think to say to yourself, 
that we are coming and <clears throat> taking possession of the land because we're so righteous. He said, in fact, you guys are a stiff necked, stubborn people. And then he recounts several of the ways in which they were. He said, I'm bringing you into this land because I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so in the same way, I affirm Israel's right to the land, not because they're righteous, not because their government is perfect, not because they're handling anything correctly necessarily. We affirm their right to the land and their support to the land the same way God does. God promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God keeps his promises. Now, as we know, in ancient times, all we got is read the Old Testament. How many times do we see that God judged Israel for their wicked leaders, uh, for their injustices? In fact, they were. it was so bad that he destroyed the northern kingdom, sent them into exile, into uh, into this into the rest of the world in 722 BC he did the same thing to the southern king of Judah sending them to Babylon you know in 586 BC so how we reconcile this is hey look we're not here to give carte, carte blanche approval for everything the Israeli government does any more than God does um they're not the, the Israeli government and I would say most of Israel there are some uh, messianic believers in Jesus, but most of the people there, they're either atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, etc. Uh, it's about 15% uh, Judaistic, Judaism religion, but they don't believe in Jesus. Many of the, the current government uh, is the most religious government in the history of Israel, but many of the, the right-wing people are very anti-Christian. So it's not like they're they're friends of, of, of Christians, of believers. Now, Netanyahu is. Netanyahu is very friendly with evangelicals, because he recognizes the value of friendship with the evangelical Christian who in general gives support for those reasons I just described. Mm -hmm. I agree. Then why would Netanyahu take on the role of a war criminal? Well, it, well, <laughs> that brings up a different perspective because this is what we know about Netanyahu. I mean, what do we know? He's a politician. I mean, he's a politician, and so he's done a lot of good things for Israel, no doubt, in, in their protection. But is he is he a perfect guy in every way that he's handled? Of course not. Uh, again, he's, he's under some indictments for corruption and other things, and we'll see how those play out. But at the end of the day, um, I think Christians need to be wise in saying, yes, the, the land, look, God said the land belongs to the people of Israel, but that does that give them a right to do any sort of of uh, of genocide of any type? Of course not. We actually see uh, in the Old Testament that the land was always the the, the people of Israel's, but they were to treat the foreigner, the alien that came in, with the same level of respect, and the law applied to them as well. So no doubt we see again in the Old Testament that the government of Israel did not uh, operate uh, perfectly. And in fact, many times they were very wicked. And so we just have to keep all those things in biblical balance. Okay. That's uh, Doug. Uh, sorry. I, I took uh, Mondo off on a long journey there here. Why don't you it's bring us back? One, yeah. It's an important, oh, no. I think these are the questions that people ask. No, we need more context. We need so much more context. Um, you know, the, when Moses is up there at the mountain at Horeb, uh, Sinai, and he comes down with the tablets and the Lord says, you know, they sinned against me. They, they melted their gold. They made an idol of a calf. And I saw that you sinned against me. So I'm going to destroy everything and give it to you because you're not worthy of it. You stiff neck people. There's a, a few references in the Bible where I do laugh where God's like, my children are a foolish, stupid people. I'm like, ah. Oh. Well, I can't get in trouble now. I'm going to say that. Um, well, you like but, you've never said that about your kids, or I haven't said it about mine. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's all loving, I, right? I find it interesting. Here we are. They got in so much trouble for the calf, for the the golden calf, and yet here we are waiting for a calf. Now we know that there's been five red heifers. Uh, you and I talked about this last year. There's been five red heifers that's grown here in Texas. Texas made um, that's been sent. What was that back in September of 22? They, they received yep. five heifers. September 15th. Yep. Yeah. And so they're, they're waiting for, a, a, I don't know, a year 
maybe a year or two to see if any blemishes come up. They've all been approved by the Orthodox priests. And then from there, um, if any blemishes come up, well, then the process starts over again because nothing less than perfect will be acceptable. And so, you know, it's uh, it's interesting that we're in this time frame to see if any of the heifers uh, have any blemishes. The, the clock is ticking. They don't have three years and then they're no longer heifers. They're full blown cows. Uh, so if anything happens, it, the clock starts again. Right. But what's interesting is that the Argentina president was just at the wall down there in Israel, and he said that we should destroy the Muslims' Alaska mosque and build the third temple. And he moved their embassy, uh, I believe, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So now we've got two world leaders who said that before. I'm going to get in so much trouble because I did this. God. Oh, you just did, man. You're busted. Oh, I know. I know everybody. The Illuminati. Here we go. Um, <laughs> I, I count weird, all right? This is the American. Does YouTube three, censor the that German too? Three. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. People and the, their hand signals, whatever. Um, but look, it's interesting that now you have um, the, the Argentina president. I wonder if we're going to hear more world leaders come out and talk about the third temple. Do you do you uh, propose that that's going to be um, maybe something that happens this year? Well, let me give you an update on exactly what you're describing. So these these cows, these five cows, as you mentioned, uh, were they were born October 5th to the 12th of 2021. According to rabbinic tradition and rabbinic writings, um, they have to be in their third year. Now, for Americans, when we say third year, we say, well, my kid is three years old. That means he's 36 months plus whatever. But the, the Jewish rabbinic writings don't speak that way. What, what they mean is you have to be in your third year, which means if you are two years and six months old, you're in your third year. You just haven't completed it yet, but you are in your third year. And so what they've decided is that these cows need to be two years and one month old because then that'll put them well into their third year or at least officially a month into their third year. So they, all five of them passed that date, that threshold uh, around November 15th last just a few months ago. So as of that date, all five of them were of age. Now, that's the first time and I'm not really, I'm not a sensationalist by any means, but this is the first time in 1900 years since the first century that you have qualified red heifers, at least one. And in fact, at the time, uh, there were five. Now, since then, one has fully become disqualified. Another one is on the way to probably being disqualified. It hasn't been official yet. But three are are fully qualified. Now, just for the sake of people understanding how serious they are, um, these these five um, cows, they, they got them when they were around 11 months old uh, from a ranch in Rockwall, Texas. And they paid $100,000 each for these. That's an expensive piece of steak, man. I mean, that's... that's <laughs> and secondly, it cost them $250,000 to ship them on an American Airlines special flight to the land of Israel. So they're all there. So right now there's three that are still fully qualified, potentially a four. Okay. Well, um, I reached out to the guy that's ha that's managing the care of the cows a couple of weeks ago, asked him for an update. And he said, Mondo, we're, our plan is to perform this ceremony. The red heifer ceremony does not happen on the, on the temple mount. So there's no risk of anything there. It happens, it happens on the Mount of Olives, which they have two pieces of property that they have there. And they plan on having it on, on between Passover and the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, basically April 22nd through June 12th. So, I mean, that's right around the corner. That's only you this know, year six, right now. Yeah. Six weeks from now, six, seven weeks. Mm-hmm. And they're in a farm in Haifa, right? They, they not Haifa. 
they are at a visitor center in Shiloh, which is just you know north of Jerusalem, not too far. So they are there. They're in a visitor center. They they you can see them. You can't go up and touch them, but you can see them there. And uh, so yes, here we are. You know, it's whatever the date is, the twenty third. So you know, we're talking. Um, you know, two months from right now. They're, they they they're planning on this ceremony now. What the guy told me is he actually emailed me and he said, "Hey Mondo, you know, pray for me because I'm trying to work out a way to live stream the ceremony to 800 million people." Now, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. So again, here we are. The subtitle of my book is. The last piece of the third temple puzzle. Everything else is done. What they need is the red heifer to be done, to be slaughtered. They can get the ashes. Then they can sprinkle the area. They can sprinkle the people. Anybody that comes up on the temple mount eventually to offer their, their sacrifice will be able to be sprinkled and clean. So this is the last thing they're waiting for. And for the first time in 1900 years, we could be watching a red heifer slaughter burning ceremony happening on the Mount of Olives. I mean, we're living in extremely exciting times. And again, we know that the Bible says that there will be a third temple. We don't know when, but part of the one of the prerequisites to have the temple is to have the red heifer according to the Jewish rabbi's mindset. And here we are, they've accomplished, uh, again, obtaining at least three 100% qualified cows and and that's called the shabbat para well shabbat shabbat para is actually on march 29th of this year and the shabbat para it you you have shabbat just means saturday right it's their weekly but you on you have different labels for different shabbats throughout the year and and the shabbat para is actually a very specific day on the jewish religious calendar this year it happens to be on march 29th but they, they, which that would seem to be a great time to offer the ceremony, but from what they've described to me, they they plan on having it on the greater ceremony, which is Passover. And the the Shabbat par, if I'm if I'm correct, that's Sabbath of the red heifer. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, I do. Para I do. just means cow. That's why um, in Hebrew you would say para aduma. Aduma Edom is the word red. So Ad Aduma is a feminine of the Hebrew feminine. So yeah, para Aduma, which means the red, the red cow. Egla is a word for calf. So Moses says, bring a para, which is a, a an aged cow, which means it's in its third year. It's not a calf, it's in its third year. Now, I do have a question about timing. Is there an established time frame between the slaughter of the red heifer and the emergence of the third temple? Well, um, that I write this in the book that that's the question. So once these check, 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 right. They have these other things checked off. <laughs> well, what's next? It's all geopolitical. How can they actually accomplish this? And what I write about is the change. You, you, what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is a change in the rabbinic movement. You know, 50 years ago, the rabbis would never even go on the Temple Mount. They actually have a law forbidding Jews to go on the Temple Mount because they didn't want it to contaminate it. It's already contaminated. But we've seen a change in the last 15 years within some of the, the rabbinic movements, not all of them, that they're saying, absolutely, we're, we're going to reject that commandment, that, re, you know, restriction. And now we're going to encourage everybody to go on the Temple Mount in order to fulfill uh, the commandments, the mitzvahot. So I think what 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 you're asking is a very good question because the ultimate answer is nobody really knows. Yeah, that's right. The politics here, and the only way that they would be capable of doing it, they're willing. They have the cornerstone. And in fact, many times they try to drive it up <laughs> on the Temple Mount every year. And the police, the security, the Israeli police turn them around and say, no, they've tried to do offerings. They try to get up and maybe do a lamb on there just kind of as a as a figurative uh, uh, type. Please turn them around. But this is the most religious government in, in, in the history of Israel. And so 
what we're seeing in I write about this, the development of that in the book, the shift of the government itself being more religiously right and being mm-hmm. willing to raise to to challenge the status quo. Now, what we do know, and, and this is fact, um, the, the one of the Hamas leaders, uh, one of the military uh, wings of the the, the defense uh, military Hamas leaders came out over the past few weeks and said, one of the reasons why we went in and, and attacked on October 7th was because of the red cows. So it's interesting that they mentioned specifically the red cows as a precursor to trying to disrupt the status quo of the Temple Mount. And so they called it the Oxa Rage. You know, they they were talking about trying to gain sympathy from the rest of the world, um, which they're very good at propaganda. And they mentioned the red cows specifically. But what we're seeing in the Israeli government since October 7th, look, what happened October 7th, it ticked off almost all Israelis. They they became, remember all the protests? I mean, I was there last mm-hmm. March and May. Lots of protests, lots of division. Once that happened, unity. And they realized that they were fighting amongst themselves over, you know, issues. But they were these issues that they had were not existential. What Hamas wants to do is an existential threat from the river to the sea, right? And so since October 7th, uh, you have a tremendous amount of unity, but you also have a very strong unity against the lack of true sovereignty on the Temple Mount. And so what you see is many of the gover- uh, the governing um, ministers, uh, Itamir Gavir is one of the main ones, very, very religious, again, very anti-Christian, um, but he's trying, he's very, very, if it was up to him, he would go build the temple tomorrow on the on the Temple Mount. Okay, and then another question I have is um, the concern that some people will have regarding the Antichrist co-opting the Third Temple. Well, we know that's guaranteed. So the mm-hmm. we because a couple things. Um, it's that I'm glad you brought that up because uh, in Daniel nine twenty seven. Um, we see very clearly. I mean, we live in the day, and the, we we live in the day that pronouns matter, right? Okay, that's that's the day we live in, and, and we would agree. Uh, biblically speaking, pronouns matter, and in Daniel nine twenty seven, it says he very clearly the antecedent is the prince of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary, which are the Romans. So this prince is Roman. He's not necessarily from Rome. He's from the, the the geographical area of the Roman Empire. So the he is this figure, this prince figure, which we understand as being the Antichrist. And it says, he shall make a covenant with the many, which is Israel, very clearly Israel in Daniel 11, 33. So this guy's making a covenant with Israel, but in the middle of the covenant for this seven, for the one week, the seven year period, which is three and a half years. He breaks the covenant and he stops the sacrifices and the offerings, which mm-hmm. you're like, whoa, sacrifice and offerings. Well, the only place you have that is in a temple. And then what we see when he does that, we see this coinciding with the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 15, that Jesus spoke of, standing in the holy place, some image, something that he puts there. But in addition, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, that he goes in to the temple of God declaring himself to be God. So he he goes in and he corrupts. And from this moment forward, he stops the sacrifices and he turns on the Jews. He made a covenant with them. He betrays them. He kicks them out, sets up his image, abomination of desolation, declares himself to be the true God above all gods. Then he seeks to commit genocide against all of the Israeli Jews and that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see that, flee, get into the mountains as fast as possible. Don't get to go into your house. Don't even go back and get your coat. Get out of town as fast as possible because what, what, of what you just described. Yeah. So don't go home. Does that mean that persecution is set loose on Christians? Yes. And what you see, two things. Uh, Revelation 12, that... The, that is when it's in the middle of the tribulation period when the Antichrist, he, he's there in the beginning. 
But his his authority is not unlimited until the midpoint. He he gets this mortal wound where I actually believe he dies and gets resurrected as a mimicking of Jesus's resurrection. God allows it. Not that Satan has that power on his own. God allows it. His mortal fatal wound was healed. He Satan's cast out of heaven. It says he he gets authority to go genocidal, not only on the Jews, but in Revelation 12, it says anybody else that has the testimony of Jesus, which are, you know, at this point is what I would call tribulation believers. So however we want to mm. say it, these are believers in Jesus as well as the Jews who the Antichrist goes to seek genocide and to kill them all. This is where I get super paranoid. AI surveillance state tracking who's who. Where's your allegiance? They already know, don't they? Oh, I think think about this this right here. I mean, if it doesn't get censored eventually, I mean, maybe Rumble will take longer. But I mean, I'll tell you what, if it, it wouldn't take long. I mean, again, for me, my social media, obviously, they know where I stand. I mean, I can't, I couldn't even erase it all. Yeah, me too. I've got yep. a trail. Doug has a trail. Yep. Um, interesting advice, though. Do not go home. So will there be like when the Antichrist is risen? That's when we're supposed to flee at that moment. Well, you know, there's different perspectives, right? I mean, I believe that I believe in a preacher rapture. Not everybody does. That's fine. But what we do know. So it, let's say that I'm wrong and I'm here. Well, um, I'll tell you what the, the for Christians during this time, if we are not raptured out of here prior to the tribulation, I'll tell you what um, I did. A, I did a message. What's today, Friday? I, I did a message last night on a, on, a, on a conference up in Minnesota. And uh, I laid down all of the verses in the book of Revelation. And I said, hey, look, guys, I, I, if we aren't raptured out of here, okay, some people don't believe that's okay. If we're not, I'm just telling you, there, there, there's, I'm not here to give you any comfort. Because it is massive martyrdom everywhere. Millions and millions of it. And I gave all the scriptures. There is no escape. There is no escape. In fact, probably the best thing to do is just to walk up to headquarters of the Antichrist, tell him about Jesus, and just put your head down and get it cut off. Because, you know, that would probably, in my mind, would be the easier way to go than to, to, than to be on the run, which is what Jesus says. Get out of town. These people, the, and it's the, specifically the context is in Jerusalem because he talks about Pray that your flight isn't on the Sabbath. Pray that you're not pregnant or you're a nursing mother trying to bring your baby. Because the fact of the matter is, there is no escape. Um, people are going to be beheaded. The, the, the religious movement, the, what we call the harlot in the book of Revelation, is drunk. And it says she's drunk on the blood of the Christians, of the believers. So the chances of us surviving all seven years is almost zero. Yeah, I have a... I've studied this eschatology a lot, and I don't, you know, I've never been pre-tribulation rapture. To me, personally, it doesn't matter. You could die tomorrow, be ready to see Christ immediately. Um, but in its in its context, it's, it's a fun conversation to have, right? Mm -hmm. um, in its context, and we should not be mean to each other over this. But, you know, I, I look at it as like, you know, worst case scenario, how does this go? I'm actually writing finally a, a book called the Record Chronicles series that actually puts you in the middle of tribulation at the end of that three and a half years when it's no longer peaceful and it's all of a sudden a bloodbath, which is what it will be. Um, yep. Martyred, you'll go into captivity, the rest will be running. And it even says in scripture that people who will think that they're killing you that they're what they're doing to the Christians, they're doing rightly for the Lord. Like they're, they're so drunken and given over because it's, it's strange when you think about the power that the antichrist will have. Um, and I kind of go into like, look at just the power social media has over people. Look at just the power the freaking internet has over people. People are willing to do the stupidest things you've ever seen in your life just to get like a few likes and thumbs up and shares. Imagine what they'll do for the Antichrist and his admiration, or it'll be because if you don't, you're going in the lion's den next. 
but he it says clearly revelation 12 13 that the entire world will be forced to bow to him every kingdom every king every queen every president everyone will be forced to bow to him and so we come into this context mondo let's just have a conversation about this doug before you go there i'm going to just interrupt a second not all of us are going to bow i wear this every day we will not bow daniel 3 17 through 18 no no hey, us, you cut my us, head off you can hold me down us but christians i ain't bowing. will not be doing that yes yeah, i am us not bowing. Yeah, we us christians bowing. will not be doing that um but yes. the rest of the world will yeah and it says that you will be forced to, right? That's why we're going to be running. We're going to be subject of, you know, the eye of Sauron is going to be on the Christians because we're not going to do it. Um, but this is this is a, a conversation that rarely is had. Who fights the Antichrist and is and loses? You know, is is it a is it battalions of Christians who say, you know what? We're, we we've got to be the buffer for the families to be able to flee. I don't know. I, I play this out in my head. How how does this go? Where, where where does your mind go with this, Mondo? Well, there's a couple things, and um, the Revelation thirteen seven is in Daniel seven twenty one. Both say the same thing. They're speaking about this time. Revelation thirteen seven says that the Antichrist, the Beast, was given authority to conquer and kill Christians, believers, saints, the saints. So th there, there is no um, ultimate fight that works. Uh, now, again, I'm not saying that we bow. That's not what I'm saying at all. In, in fact, you know, um, when we do give our heads, you know, it, again, you know, for again, if, if the pre-tribulation view is wrong, whatever, let's just say it is for the moment, for hypothetical. Then when we give our heads, you know, big deal. So we're killed. We get resurrected. <laughs> okay, that's that's the promise. So to we see in Revelation again. 20 that Jesus resurrects all those that died during the tribulation that were beheaded. If that's what it says. So and, and there's countless of them. Daniel 7 21 says the same thing that the little horn is given authority to conquer the saints during that time. So the any resistance that we might have is not going to be successful that 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 saints would do. Now, that doesn't mean they're not resisting, but what, what we do see is that there is uh, what I see happening is in the mid in the first half of the tribulation period, the Antichrist, the beast system is in place. But it's still continuing to con to consolidate its worldwide domination. And when you get to Revelation 13 um, in the midpoint, uh, he, he has done it through force because it says, who can make war with the beast? The, the people are worshiping the beast. They're worshiping the dragon. They're worshiping the image. And, and in the middle point of the tribulation is when the mark of the beast is what you're describing. Again, in, in the first half, there, that still is not there yet. There's still room to be in the system, but yet not to be totally forced. There's still a little bit of freedoms. There's a lot of death and carnage through war, famine, pestilence. Uh, that's Revelation 6. We see that. But when you get to the midpoint where the mark is instilled, that is when the deciding factor happens. And when you either give your allegiance knowingly this isn't an accident you take the mark and you you address basically antichrist is lord where believers will be saying jesus is lord and they'll resist it they'll resist it but there's no uh, successful resistance uh at at the end they're all they're they're martyred and killed and so that's why i said there there's 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 no comfort <laughs> really except hey you're going to get resurrected uh, for those that are living in the tribulation, some people, uh, based on preparations, uh, they might survive longer than others. Um, you know, if if you got one year supply of food for your family of five, well, you know that'll last you a year. Uh, are you going to share it with anybody? Well, if you share it with another family of five, that means you just dropped it to six months worth of rations. You know, so you, you know what do you need to survive? Well, you probably need twenty five years worth. For every person, because you're hopefully you would share, and that's assuming that the government at the the unlimited uh, 
unlimited power of the tyrannical beast system with its economics doesn't find you. So again, there, there. I'm just the reality is there is no comfort at all given in a temporary sense for those living in the tribulation period, except if you die, you'll be resurrected into new life. And Mark Zuckerberg's probably not going to let us go party with him at his underground bunker. His two hundred fifty million dollar bunkers. Yeah, probably now, probably not again. Happen. He he's going to be fine. Why? Because he's going to he'll 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 worship. The, he's par, probably part of the system, you know. So he'll have no problem taking the mark. And again, as we know, the elites still will be doing just fine. Don't yep. hurt the oil and the wine. Right, they're going to mourn when Babylon is destroyed because they were they became rich through her. So you're going to have the earth dwellers, the way that the book of Revelation describes it, and you're going to have those that are not, which are the resistors. And there will be resistors, but it's just again, it's not a comforting outlook. Yeah, the way I've the way I've game planned this in my head is like you know, could you imagine the the fleet, Dave, of the uh, the navies, the armadas, the submarine corps. Uh, the the commanders for the air force at the nuclear silos, right? Yep. You know, to die as gang, Christ is king. Press the red button. Here comes nukes heading straight to Jerusalem because that's the headquarters of the Antichrist, right? Well, not until the end. I mean, well, let me rephrase it. In the midpoint, he goes into Jerusalem and, and establishes himself there, and I don't think he ever leaves because he's seeking to again to genocide the rest of the Jews during that time and he flees he seeks them but revelation 12 says god protects the jews for this period of time that one third of them are going to survive until the end when they call upon the name of jesus and it brings closure to that time of of god's wrath what do you think the other nations like the uh the islamic nations when they see this are they going to think the antichrist is their mahdi and they're going to be there to Mm -hmm. join see that there's two views on this, which I would say two basic views, two primary views. Um, well, I would say three. One, uh, which I don't agree with, but w- some people, some Christian brothers and sisters, again, we love them, they're brothers. Um, they believe that the Antichrist is going to be Islamic. And so he'll be able to unite mm-hmm. them and be the Mahdi that you're describing. Um, I don't see that as being realistic because um, that, that particular person is... Um, going to be received by the jews as their messiah in john 5 43 and i don't believe there they would receive a a, a islamic messiah um the other view is that um the as it relates to the overall picture uh, of the world that he is going to have most of the world behind him the west primarily um again he's going to be consolidating his his issues But that the Messiah, again, would be Roman. He'd make the agreement with Jews. But also we know in Revelation 16 that the the river Euphrates is dried up. Why? To make room for the kings of the east. So I think that China and some of the others are going to resist. It's a global system. But China's out for themselves. Let's just be honest. They're not looking to share power. Share power, as you mentioned, Sauron is not willing to share power with Sauron, right? Okay, even though Sauron thinks so, uh, the, the Lord doesn't share power. So I think China's going to go along with the globalism because it's convenient for them, uh, but it ultimately is not going to happen. And so when you talk about Islam, the other question with Islam is: Will they join in? Will they be part of the resistance with China? Or will they join in with the West? That's pretty hard to imagine that they would. But the third scenario is that according to the the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine, is that if we're if we're seeing maybe the beginnings of what we might understand possibly as a Psalm eighty three situation right now, uh, that means that uh, most of the nations, the surrounding nations of Israel, are going to be annihilated and, and eliminated and become weak. Uh, that Iran is going to be destroyed. Russia is going to be wiped out. And so you have this Islamic crescent going to be relatively neutralized by the Gog Magog war. And then the Antichrist steps on the scene. And so for the most part, Islam becomes very humbled. And so they're not really part of the equation in the same way. So there's a few different scenarios of how it could work. So we would think that maybe China would try to wage war. The dragon would try to wage war on the beast. 
America, if and who really knows, I would love for you to explore that path of what is happening to America. But if Russia gets taken out, China gets taken out. I mean, if these two, there's, there's, if these three superpowers are resisting the Antichrist in any way, one's communist, I will not serve anyone. One claims to be ethnically Christian for the most part, I won't serve them. If their leadership is taken out or if their country is just taken off the uh, the platform for a while, who could wage war against them? I mean, what what would the armies of the Antichrist literally look like at this point? When the superpowers can't do anything to them. Yeah, I think so. Let, let, let's look at that for a moment. I think Russia will be removed very clearly, the land of Magog in the God Magog war. That is crystal clear. So I think that, that their superpower status is, is, is heading towards, uh, again, being neutralized. I think America, um, we're, we're, we're at, I mean, again, there's a lot of theological perspectives. Um, in my view, I think that at, at the time of the rapture, there's going to be a lot of people that the rapture, uh, again, if it's true, I mean, I, I mean, I would, again, there's, I'm not saying I'm dogmatic. If it's true, the country that's going to be affected most would be America. We would go from this status to this status when, when you have 50 to 60 to 80 million people, you know, being taken off the earth. I mean, that is a lot of people in every area of society. We know that Christians, again, can be very intelligent, very productive. Imagine that gap all of a sudden, boom, uh, from a socioeconomic industrial complex nature. I mean, it, it would be amazing all throughout the, the it, it would ruin America. Now, there's hardly any Christians in the leadership of China, so it's not going to affect them. There's hardly any Christians, I would say, in, in the major leadership of Europe. It's not going to affect them. And so you have these other countries, which, again, if that, according to that model, would be very unaffected. Um, but United States would. But let's say that the pre trib is wrong. Well, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing an implosion and a and a, and a an American level destruction even without that look at our debt uh we know thir- you know who knows in how many years 50 trillion that's unsustainable so all it would take is a a worldwide economic uh, situation and America could be re- EMP you know maybe at the last moment Russia does an EMP and we're back to the Stone Age uh, again none of us recover from that um we don't know how to live apart from, you know, electricity and water. We don't have wells. You know, we don't have these things. We don't know how to grow our own food. We could be eliminated uh, super quick. So if you take that out, uh, again, Russia's out. I think China would be in in the picture a little bit longer uh, because we know at the end, towards the end of the tribulation, China is there. The kings of the East are making their way, but they are resisting. I, I think they go along in the middle of the global system, but later they rebel against him and they're coming across. And we know as well in Revelation 16 that we the, the, the Armageddon scenario, it's not just a single campaign war. It's a full scenario. And what happens, you know, um, three demons are released and they go to all the nations of the world and they gather them where? In, in Jerusalem, in Armageddon for war. So you the Antichrist... His his paradise of 42 months at the last part of the tribulation comes to an end when the rest of these rebels come to fight against him. And that's the basis for Armageddon when at, at that moment they're getting together to fight him. He's going after the Jews and then Jesus is coming down at the end and they all turn their, their guns on him. I mean, so they're not going to have that guy rule over him. So that that's no. the overall possible scenarios of what you might have. Hold one second. We're on pause. Doug, what's our time? I... We're at 51 minutes. That's what I got to. Okay, back in. Um, we we talked about the end time armies for Satan. Um, do you think they're AI? Because I wonder about the phrase in the Bible said there'd be no flesh left alive if Jesus didn't return. So that's that that passage is is excellent. It, in the context, he says it in the Olivet Discourse. And and what Matthew what Matthew twenty four and, and Mark thirteen nineteen, what Jesus says there, he says, what's coming upon the earth is so bad that there's never been anything in the history of the creation itself that has been as bad as this time of judgment and war and destruction. That includes the flood of Noah. I mean, think about that. I mean, that was pretty universal. And he says, there's nothing been as bad. 
it, because I, th- I imagine in the flood you were wiped out and you were drowned pretty quick. It was it was over pretty quick. This is going to be an extensive period of massive amounts of judgment. First, a, a fourth of the earth is dead. Then an, a third. That's a half. So G- Jesus says, look, if it was not shortened, this period of judgment, if it was to go on forever, no flesh would survive. But it's been shortened to this period of seven years for the sake of the elect. Otherwise, if it continued on, there'd be nobody left on earth. So I think that's what he's referring to is now <clears throat> that brings up the other question, though, is is AI going to be involved? A hundred percent. I mean, Doug, you could talk about this, too. But we already see the ways in which the military just released this information where they are now using AI to take um, assessments of the battlefield and then giving the AI authority to send specific Again, AI controlled drones, as we know, drones are amazing pieces of machinery and they can cause massive havoc depending on how they're armed. So that the AI are given control and a authoritative control to make decisions on the battlefield based on what they're seeing. So, I mean, we're if we're seeing this now, there's no way that it's not going to be used by the Antichrist. Sentient, yeah. yeah, sentient and very powerful. We're almost out of time, gentlemen. And Mondo, you've referenced your book a couple of times and we'd be remiss if we didn't tell the audience how to get a copy. Well, you know, if you want to support a ministry, you can go to prophecywatchers.com and get it there. Uh, Some people, you know, they want it a a little bit quicker or whatever. Uh, It is on Amazon, so they can find it there as well. And I have it both in in print and digital on Amazon. Hey, Mondo, before we leave, I, I have one quick question. What gives you hope during this time? Well, you know, at the at the gloomiest thing is possible. Uh, Jesus made a, a reference in Revelation two ten to a specific time of trouble that we know happened in ancient history in the time of the early church, and he said, "Look to this particular situation to the church at Smyrna." He says, "Look, the devil's going to throw some of you into into tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so ultimately. No matter what happens, I mean, I could be living in Iran right now. So whether it's a tribulation or basic life now, that uh, as you said earlier, Doug, Philippians 1, 19 through 20, and Paul said, to die is gain. It's better to depart and be with Christ. This isn't the end all for us, that we know that even if we die as a martyr, Jesus will resurrect us, give us the crown of life, and we'll live forever in a brand new glorified body. So you know what? You can't harm us uh, eternally. That gives me absolute comfort. That's a great final word. Amen. Well, our, our, our guest here on um, the Common Sense Show slash Doug and Dave Intel Report is Mondo Gonzalez. Make sure you check out his site and get a copy of his book. Mondo, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for giving us so much time in this two-part series. And Doug, my friend, a bit of do. And uh, we'll see you both back here again, I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys.